Hey my future pharmacy technicians, congratulations! You're planning on becoming a pharmacy technician, also known as a pharmacy tech? Well, whether you are already working in a pharmacy or just starting out in the allied healthcare industry, you have chosen a remarkable career path. Okay, fine. It can get a little stressful and overwhelming sometimes, but I know if you've chosen to become a pharmacy tech, you're a tough cookie. You've got this. Okay, so if you want your day to go by smoother and less stressful as a pharmacy tech, you've got to have confidence that you're doing the right thing. Because otherwise, some situations can drive you crazy. Now, if you familiarize yourself with the pharmacy laws, you will know what you can and cannot do. And then, based on your good knowledge and understanding of the law, you will not only save yourself of any trouble, but also protect the patients. As you know what, patients rely on you for getting their medications and other healthcare services. So, the laws and regulations of the pharmacy basically vary from state to state. PTCB certification is accepted in all 50 states. So, for the purpose of passing the exam, you have to really focus on the federal law and then whatever state you choose to work, uh, you should know that state's corresponding laws. So understanding laws basically is a lot of reading and I can't really cover everything in like a 10-12 minutes video. So I'm going to go over some major laws that you must know while working in a pharmacy. So let's get going. Okay, so the first law that's very important is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, in short HIPAA. This is something I'm pretty sure you may have already heard and if not, then you will hear it and continue to hear it a lot in any healthcare setting, including pharmacy. Now, this law basically protects the patient information. So according to this law, you cannot share patients' protected information with anyone not authorized by patient or anyone who is not directly involved in patient care. Now, the examples of uh, patient uh, protected health information includes, but is not limited to, basically anything that identifies patients present, past, or future health information, any medication list, or something similar that kind of identifies anything related to patient. So you don't wanna share this information with anyone. However, there are some exceptions. There are people or entities who you can share the information with, such as doctors involved in patient's care, um, insurance for billing purpose, any law enforcement agency when they have the um, proper disclosure order. And now these, again, are just a few examples. There's a more vast list that you wanna go over, okay? But the point is you shouldn't be talking about patients' protected information to their employer, to their family member or friends. Uh, you shouldn't talk about patients' health condition or other protected information in public areas or any open space where others can hear it because if you do, you can be held liable for breaching what's called the patient's right of privacy. And when you start working in any healthcare setting, be it hospital or retail, you will be signing a HIPAA acknowledgement form, which basically is kind of a pledge that you understand and you take the oath that under the law, you will be protecting patients' information. Okay, so this is also a super important law. And under this law, you must dispense legend and other control medications with some exceptions in a child-proof container, unless otherwise specified by the patient, of course. Now, yes, a patient can voluntarily ask for an easy cap or snap cap. Otherwise, all the medications uh, of all the patients must be placed in a child lock container. And I think this is super important to remember when dispensing a medication in an original uh, manufacturer bottle, because sometimes what happens is that these manufacturer bottles don't have a child proof lid on them. So in that case, um, some technicians like forget to switch that lid. So you should always, always switch that regular lid with a child proof lid or just transfer the medication in an ember vial, okay? Now, another thing to remember is that there is one medication which is an exception to this law. 
Can you guess which one? Well, those of you who guessed it's a sublingual nitroglycerin, bravo, you're right. And those who couldn't guess, don't worry, because I'll tell you why and then you will never forget. So basically, nitroglycerin, or the brand name Nitrostat, is used in an emergency situation when somebody is probably having a heart attack or engine attack. So in such an emergency, you want to make sure that the medication is easy to retrieve from the container. Uh, now let's say if you put it in a childproof container, it will make it hard for the person who is having a heart attack to open that container and pop the pill. Because in such an instant, in every second, it's crucial for a patient and you want to make it easier for the patient to um, access the medication. And in a child-proof uh, container, if you notice that you have to kind of press the lock on one side of the lid and then open it, so it does take a little bit of effort and energy. And you can imagine a person who's having a heart attack does not have that kind of energy or time. Okay, so that's one exception. So this law limits the sale of over-the-counter Sudafed and Ephedrine uh, products, which are very commonly used in uh, cough and cold medications as a um, decongestion. Under this law, there is a sale limit and a 30-day purchase limit, meaning a customer can buy only a certain amount within a month period. And also, such products should be uh, behind the pharmacy counter or out of customer's direct reach and pharmacy must maintain the uh, electronic or physical sales logbook. Uh, you must get patient's identification, either a valid passport or driver's license. It's because a Sudafed can be illegally used to manufacture uh, methamphetamine, which has literally become a national uh, epidemic. In retail setting, one technician is permitted to one pharmacist on duty and two technicians for each additional pharmacist. So that means when there is one pharmacist on duty, there can be only one technician. However, when there are two pharmacists on duty, there can be three technicians. Now, can you tell how many technicians a pharmacy can have if there are three pharmacists? Well, three pharmacists? Well, type in your answer in the comment section and I'll let you know if you got it right or not. Okay, so this was the tech to pharmacist ratio in retail setting. However, in hospital setting, it's not confusing like that. Uh, in a hospital or clinical setting, each pharmacist on duty um, can have two technicians. So it's simple one is to two ratio. So as a technician, you will see that people will be dropping off prescriptions with you all the time and you will be uh, typing prescriptions as well. So you must know what information a prescription should have, like patient's name, uh, birthday, address, name and quantity of the drug prescribed, also directions and the date when the prescription was issued. And as far as prescriber's information is concerned, a prescription must have the name address and phone number of the prescriber, also prescriber's signatures and a prescriber's DEA number if it's a prescription for a controlled substance. Now this of course is not a complete list of prescription requirements but you kind of get an idea. Okay so the life of prescription is one year from the date it's written unless it's a prescription of a controlled substance and in that case it's six months. Okay, so it makes sense to have only enough refills good for the life of prescription. Like often we get a prescription from a reg for a regular non-controlled substance and it will have like 15 or 20 refills for a monthly prescription. And I don't really understand the logic. It's either somebody at the doctor's office is not paying attention or they just don't know what they're doing. So really, if the number of refills are not fixed on the prescription, then guess what's gonna happen? Prescription will be dispensed and after a year, 
when a patient calls to get a refill and you tell the patient that, hey, sorry, there's no refill on the prescription, you will be get yelled at because the patient will be like, oh, but my bottle says there are three more refills remaining or whatever number of refills remaining. So to avoid situations like that, as a tech, you should know the maximum number of refills prescription can have, which shouldn't exceed, of course, more than a year. Just because if you don't know, you're not gonna fix it and a pharmacist may overlook it and then you will end up in a situation like this. Anyways, refill authorization must be obtained from the prescriber whenever there are no refills remaining on the prescription. And the number of refills for schedule three to five are limited to a maximum of five refills within six months because like I said before, the life of a controlled or a scheduled prescription is six months and all refills combined for a controlled medication cannot exceed 120 day supply. Now keep in mind the original fill is not a refill. So if a control uh, prescription is written for 90 days, then can you guess how many refills it can have? Well, think about it and I'll tell you the answer at the end of the video. Okay, so now let's talk about the refills on control two medications and control two medications actually cannot have any refills. Okay, so now before I move forward, I want to talk about the control medications. I've been using this word a lot, like control 2 and control 3 to 5. I just want to talk a bit about it for those of you who don't know what I am talking about. So basically, a drug or other substances that are strictly controlled by the government because it has an abuse potential or it can cause addiction basically comes in a control category. This kind of medication basically has a high abuse and dependency potential in a sequence with the control one having the highest potential for dependency and control five has the least potential of dependency. I hope that does give you a little bit of idea what I mean by control two and control C to five. Control one is not really used in a pharmacy setting because these medications are mainly for research purpose. So that's not a point of concern in pharmacy. In pharmacy, we mainly deal with uh, control two to five. So we call them C2 to C5 medications, okay? <music> Okay, so next up is record keeping. This is another important law I wanna talk about. And as a pharmacy technician, you should definitely know this law because it's one of the tasks that mainly technicians perform. So basically there are three main categories of medications, non-control, schedule two, also called C2s and schedule three to five, also called C3s to five. And as a general rule, remember that you should always file C2 prescriptions is separate from all other prescriptions. Now, one way of filing is that you can have three separate drawers for each medication category, like one drawer for C2, one for C3s to five, and one for non-controls. Now, if there is not a lot of space or not a lot of prescriptions that a pharmacy fills in a day, then you still wanna file C2 prescriptions separate in a separate drawer but you can put C3s to five and non-controls together in one drawer. However, the C3s to five must be easily identified. So you must have a big uh, red stamp of C, which represents control on the lower right corner of the stack of the controlled prescriptions. All right, guys, so there you have it. Quick review of the seven most important pharmacy laws that you must not overlook or forget. Else, not just you, but your pharmacist in charge will be in trouble as well. Because pharmacy manager or pharmacist in charge is basically responsible for everything happening in the pharmacy. Like for me, being a manager, if one of my technicians, clerk or staff pharmacist is doing something that violates the law, then I'm actually answerable to the board because as a manager, it was my duty to ensure that all the pharmacy personnel comply with the law. That's why it's so, so important that you know all these laws and regulations and become an awesome technician because I'm sure your supervising pharmacist and pharmacy manager will surely appreciate that. Like always, my best wishes are with you. Good luck 
And should you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask in the comment section. You can also email or DM me and I will see you in the next lesson. Take care. Oh, hey guys, I'm back. Remember the question I asked earlier in the video that how many refills a scheduled three to five drug can have if it's written for a 90 day supply? Well, did you guess the right answer? The right answer is one refill. Well, good job for those of you who guessed it right. And if you didn't, then don't be confused. Just remember, control three to five prescriptions cannot have refills that exceed more than 120 days altogether.